and hanging out with me today is one of Canada's finest. Lots going on. He is Mad Child. Hello. Thank you, man. Thank Good to you. be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, let's start at the at the top. Born and raised in Vancouver, uh, BC. Yes, yes, yes. Born in Surrey, actually. And, oh, right uh, over the border. Yeah, and then, uh, but grew up in North Vancouver. That's sort of uh, 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 on the other side of downtown, across the water, and just grew up there. It's sort of not, I wouldn't say a normal childhood. I kind of went looking for the trouble. I, I definitely had like a. <clears throat> I'm comfortable in my own skin now, but I've definitely had sort of a small man's complex my whole life and sort of was at a young age was my attitude was bigger than my body. So I was never going to be let let bullies or anything happen to me. So I always sort of went and was attracted and and magnetized towards the tough guys in school, which unfortunately became the sort of bad guys in life. So. When I, I was definitely not a product of my environment. I went looking for the trouble. I could have easily lived a simple, normal life in North Van. I have an amazing family, but I sort of unfortunately uh, got on the sort of other side of the fence there for a while. I guess I just had that little bit of streak in me. I always liked the gangster movies, and, mm-hmm. and, and uh, I just was sort of gravitated towards that kind of stuff. Just being a young little alpha male. Yeah. You know? It happens. What about musically? What were you into early on? Musically, um, <clears throat> I was into punk rock and, and hardcore. I was a skateboarder since the age of 12. So we would, I was in the skateboard gang called the Gremlins, a bunch of kids from, uh, from the other side of the bridge. And uh, we would go to all the old school like punk rock gigs, Black Flag, Circle Jerks, oh, nice. yeah. you know, DRI, all that kind of stuff, Dead Kennedys. And uh, that was fun. But at the age of, I think it was 15 or 16, I met someone, uh, a graffiti artist who had moved from Detroit. And then the following year, I met my best friend for 10 years named Franco, and he had moved from Windsor, Ontario, which, of course, is right across from from Detroit. And they both had brought hip-hop records with them. Okay. And and, uh, I was, you know, I would sit and listen to these records, and I was definitely getting into it. And then I went out and bought some of my my own vinyl. I bought Dougie Fresh and the Get Fresh Crew and Salt and Peppa. I bought those first two albums on vinyl. And then the same year, I bought LL Cool J Radio on cassette and Ice T Ryan Pays. Yeah. And it was that was it. It was over for me. I, I went I went from you know loving hardcore to fully embracing hip hop and. You know, that's what I identified with, and it just felt right. And, and, and I, albums just kept coming out, and I just started loving hip-hop more and more and more. So by the time I got out of high school, the idea of me becoming a rapper started to be something that I wanted to do. There was no rappers in, really from where I was from. You yeah. know, definitely not on the side of the bridge I was living living on. But it, but it was something that I would joke around with and freestyle and write rhymes. And my best friend, another one of my best friends, Marcello Dakotas, who is now one of the biggest real estate developers in Canada. Mm. Um, I mean, they're massive. He was like, he was always someone I kind of looked up to, and he was like, you should do this for a living. This is what you should do. You're good at it. And I just sort of took his advice, and it manifested itself. I was never a writer in school. I wasn't too too into high school work. I was more into the social life. Well, completely into the social life. (laughs) Let's be honest. I went from an A student in grade 7 to like a C- minus in grade 8. It was like over for me. Now I got kicked out of two or three high schools and uh, like I said, at an early age, I I went looking for the trouble. Mm -hmm. What were some of your bigger bigger troubles early on? Oh, just little things. Getting kicked out for having stealing my dad's switchblade. Just little little kid fighting, you know. Punk Punk, type punk, things. punk, punk stuff. Yeah, little punk stuff. I never tried to be black, and I'm very much comfortable in my own skin, and I'm I'm just a white guy. But I definitely thought there was something cool going on, and I wanted to be a part of it. Not yeah. that I wanted to emulate something that I wasn't, but I always figured I could just do it and be myself. And I think I did a pretty good job of that throughout my whole career. Even if you look back with swollen members, I had ripped. Ripped sleeves on T-shirts and long, long hair. I dressed like a skateboarder. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I was never, there was those white guys wearing the FUBU and, and trying to act black. And, and I always thought that was corny, super corny. And I, I, so I, I feel good that I never had that phase of wearing the uh, hammer pants. You know what I mean? Exactly. I was never trying to be something I wasn't. I just wanted to be a part of it and bring who I was to the table. Because that's a big part of it, too, is gaining respect from the crew from others that are 
in I, the scene. Definitely. I mean, I moved to San Francisco to try to <clears throat> go somewhere where there was a real hip hop scene. I never made it all the way to L.A., which looking back is what I should have done. But, um, you know, some of my favorite rappers at the time were in the Bay Area. Souls of Mischief, we're talking 93, 94. Saphir, Dell, the funky homo sapien, yeah. like <clears throat> all those guys. And um, I had made some, made a couple records with uh, Tommy Guerrero, who was a pro skater from Powell Peralta. He was one of the first people that heard me out there. And he took me under his wing for a minute, and we, we made my first vinyl 45 record. And then uh, I did a song with Qbert. And, and I was starting to make a little bit of a buzz for myself. Mind you, at the time, I was homeless, and I was living in the Extra Large store owned by the Beastie Boys. Uh, not that I ever met them. It was a franchise. But I would sleep on the couch, <clears throat> you know, or I lived at, in the – I slept on the floor of the bomb hip-hop shop at the mm. time, and I worked there. So I was just a, you know, a homeless kid that would work and have a job, and I was just trying to find my way in hip-hop. So I guess I was keeping it real, yeah. uh, so to speak. Were you doing a lot of uh, gigs whenever you could, open no, mic nights for yourself? not yet. Okay. No, I wasn't there yet. <clears throat> I was just sort of writing and, and – wherever I had a chance to spit. I mean, we were doing a couple shows here and there when I could jump on stage, but I wasn't a performing artist yet. But one of the cool things that happened is Dell, who was one of my favorite rappers, actually came from Oakland um, to meet me. Mm. And that was a big deal. I guess he was looking for some young artists or something. So that that was a big, a big day for me. So we ended up, I ended up moving back to Vancouver, and I started selling. I got a job at Subway. Okay. And uh, I saved up my money for the first month, and I bought, uh, I think it was a quarter pound of weed. And I started selling weed. Okay. And I had uh, two kids working for me. I was still working at Subway. Can I talk about this stuff? Is sure, it okay? of course. And, and anyways, six months later, I had 40 kids working for me. Wow. And I was still working at Subway. You were moving more than two keys, though. I, I was moving a lot of weed. I had 40 kids. I, I was picking up a couple pounds a day. But still working as Subway as my cover. And just and so this is mid nineties, yes. early nineties, later nineties. Okay, later nineties. I was living in my grandma's apartment. The funny thing about it is, I could literally throw a rock, and and hit the police station from where I lived. Anyway, so so that's how I saved up enough money to start my career. And uh, from that, I invested everything I made. I only did that for you know a couple years, mm-hmm. and I got out of the game because I was like, I didn't get caught. I'm, yeah. getting, I'm getting out of the game. I mean, it was marijuana. I never felt like I was doing anybody any harm. Um, and you, you were able to put a little away, or were you spending money? Too? No, no. I, I, I mean, I was spending money for sure, but I was living at my grandma's, so yeah. who cares if you're buying a nice jacket and stuff like right. pair, new pairs of shoes? I know I was stacking paper, and I invested all that money into starting my rap career. And what I would do is I would fly my favorite rappers out, we would do a sh- put on a show for them so we could make them money. And that plus, I would pay them to do a verse, and they'd stay over at my grandma's apartment. I might get them late or whatever like that. You know, having contacts when you're you're sure. young in your city. You know, you'd put in that extra effort to impress somebody. I don't do those things anymore. <laughs> but uh, but back then, you know, you wanted to really impress the artist that you had. So we'd have everyone from Dilated Peoples to AC Alone to Mix Master Mike, you know, all come yeah. up. And, and Dell as well was one of the first people I flew up. And actually, if you look back in time, Swollen Members, which is the group that I am from and still in, we were really one of the first groups to have a whole bunch of our favorite rappers that were bigger than us on our album. Now, it was a strategic business move, but it was also something creatively that we wanted to do. And it's Brilliant. funny because now, today, that's part of the game. Everybody has to have featuring, featuring this guy, featuring this guy. It's literally the r- staple. It's the rule. So what happened was when I was living in San Francisco, I had not met Prevail yet, who is my rap partner in the group. He was doing the exact same thing at the exact same time in San Diego, sleeping on couches, getting to know the hip-hop scene, hanging out with the rock steady crew guys and all that kind of stuff. So when he was traveling back to Vancouver on the Greyhound bus or whatever, he stopped in um, – he stopped in – the store to meet me because he had heard that I was there and we hit it off and I gave him some gifts from the store and that was it didn't think about it again a year later when I moved back to Vancouver we had met at a house party 150 kids at this hotel hotel party it wasn't like a hotel room it was like a a back thing like where they put 
you know, like an outdoor special party room at this motel place. Yeah. 150 kids partying. We started freestyling back and forth for an hour and a half. Literally, the whole place was dead quiet listening to us. So we knew there was a chemistry. We were, I remember us going for a walk after that saying, let's start a group. He said, absolutely, let's do it. So, you know, within a few weeks, uh, Mocha only, we were at Denny's drinking and out for the night. And he came up with the name Swollen Members. We were like, we need a new name for the group. We all started laughing. We're like, you know what? That name will stick. Swollen Members. People are going to remember that. Mm -hmm. So we stuck with the name. And and, uh, we literally went and did our first show in, in Nanaimo in front of 80 people or whatever. And we just started making our bones and doing shows wherever we could in Vancouver, in the city. People were embracing it. Uh, People were getting behind it. We were really, really underground group, really sharp with our lyrics. So we were really winning the the hearts of uh, of our city. Mm -hmm. We weren't making bubblegum music. Right. Um, We were serious about our craft. And uh, we started, like I said, I had, had put away money and we started pressing up vinyl records. And, and we were selling like 15,000 of them at, at, for, per title. And back then, if you sold 15,000 of a, of a 12-inch, you were doing good. So we were taking, being taken notice worldwide by the underground hip-hop scene right off the bat. D- I got a call from DJ Vadim, who at the time was on Ninja Tunes from London, England. And uh, he said, you guys are dope. Want me to fly you out to England? We're like, hell yeah. We had never been anywhere before. Mm-hmm. So we went out there, and uh, that was the second place we went. The first place we went was we got to go on tour with the Tribal guys. There was a, a, clo- there was a clothing company called Tribal from San Diego. They brought us out to Japan, of all places, oh, wow. for the first okay. time. So we, we got, that was our first tour. Our second tour was going out to, to London, England, and all, sort of touring around Germany and touring around Europe. Uh, with him, and uh, then we started touring America. So we were getting big everywhere else besides Canada. Canada was the last place <laughs> we got big. So we were like building our name on a worldwide level, touring. You know, at that time you're driving around in vans sure. or whatever like that. But you're making a little dough. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Getting by. Getting by. Yeah, yeah. getting out of having to work for sure. And um, then. We had we had made this song called Lady Venom. Ended up winning a. We were nominated for a Juno, the first Juno. We didn't think there was a chance in hell of winning. I sat at home at my parents' house. I remember getting mad at my parents, like, "There's no way we're gonna win." So calm down. They announced that we won on TV. My God, my whole family hit the roof. We were we were so excited. And uh, from then, it just skyrocketed. We, we, had an, we had another album ready already, another song called Fuel Inject Ready to Go. We took a meeting with uh, Terry McBride at uh, Network Management and Network Records. At the time, they were managing Coldplay, Avril Lavigne, yeah. Sum 41. Yeah, they were no huge. We, we managed to were make Were you a, getting a lot of attention from management and labels? And They were the first people that came to us. They were the first us. ones, okay. Yeah, they, they were on it. And... Um, they did a deal with us, with me, that they had never done with anyone else, and it was a real 50-50 net deal, meaning whatever money was spent, as soon as that was spent, we started splitting it 50-50. There was no extra hidden commissions or, or costs or yeah. doubling up on advances, none of that. And I got rich from that. Like, we blew up. We won another Juno. Our album went platinum. Mm-hmm. Uh, then we won another Juno. Then our album went platinum. Then we won another Juno, and our album went gold. Um so that was crazy. I went from sort of living at my grandma's place to, to, to making millions of dollars. Ride a four-year wave of success doing festivals, 30 grand a night, 20 grand a night, every, doing shows like 200 shows a year, money pouring in, mm. me still being young. I was like 27 at the time, not handling it well, drinking every night. I was an asshole. I was conceited. You know, I had a good heart with my family and close people around me, but I definitely had a chip on my shoulder. Entitled, kind of that. Yeah, yeah. false entitlement, thinking I was something that I wasn't. And uh, I started hanging around with, uh, well, I I always sort of had gangsters that I hung around with, a bunch of East Indian guys, actually. Hmm. Rest in peace to a lot of them are dead now, unfortunately. Um, You know, once again... Everybody as individuals are good people, but a lot of these people are sociopaths. <laughs> like, there's no getting around Where it. Where did you hook up with these guys? And how? That started from high school. So you know, dudes that you were... Uh, that, that were the bad kids in school okay. ended up becoming the most notorious gangsters in Western Canada. Wow. 
and I would and they were spend, East Indians, and I huh? would, yeah, and I, well, oh, and some white guys and yeah. Chinese guys, but mostly East Indians, and and I would end up, you know, every year going over for Christmas after the next day, you know, it was like a ritual. It was like family. You yeah, know you what go I mean? see them after once a year. No, no, I was You're seeing them more than that. But my point was is that I was real tied in with these guys. So I get in. I I want. We're gonna shoot a video for a song called "Bring It Home," which was when we were blowing up. And we wanted to put a tiger in it. So I had met a guy that said, my friend can get you a tiger. Come to the, to the Hell's Angels clubhouse because he's, he's the vice president. I was like, oh, man, okay. <laughs> I never met a Hell's Angel before. Like the, the real deal. And I remember telling my girlfriend, I said, I have this weird feeling that I'm going to meet the Hell's Angels and like, get to know them really well. So I, it was like something that I knew was going to happen for some reason. I went there and I met them and it was just an automatic attraction. This was still when I thought the whole bad boy image was the coolest thing in the world and the gangster movies and the this and the that and the ego and the small man's complex. So I just got sucked right into it. They make it very romantic. Once again, great guys as individuals. And, and nothing bad ever happened with, with, with me getting to know any of these people. So let me clarify that. But I definitely got brought caught up in that world to the point where I was the only civilian going on like like a run where there's like 300 motorcycles and I'm driving behind in my Cadillac Escalade like I was hanging out looking back I get the whole play you know they have a have a lot of um, negative attention from from the press because of the police whatever this was a way for them to get some good light sh- shined on them. The, the, the biggest rapper in, in the country hanging out with them. I get the whole play. And I think, you know, we all sort of just got along as well as, as people. And this was the Vancouver chapter. Chapters, charters. Yeah. There's number. Okay. There's yeah, a number, number of, them. of them. But I would go across Canada and get invited to every clubhouse along the way almost. Okay. So there would be parties after my concerts. It was just de- madness. It was debauchery. It was just crazy i was drinking every night i i mean i don't understand how i looking back i couldn't do that now was was drinking your drug of choice at the time yeah i was but it's funny i would drink you know 18 heinekens and jack daniels at night for every show but i'd go home and i wouldn't even think to have a beer in the fridge so i might come home for a month and not even have a drink okay it was like a crutch for me sure so with partying and all that kind of stuff one day a guy who had nothing to do with the club uh uh, offered me a Percocet and I was about to do a show in Kelowna and I popped a Percocet while drinking beer and that was it for me. Cloud nine had the best, funnest night of my life. I was like, I had found the answer. Percocets. It was it. Mm. No idea that it was synthetic heroin. No, I, there was no epidemic at the time. So I started, you know, I was hanging out with these other crazy guys too and we would do Percocets all the time and drink beer and go to mansion parties and then eventually that turned into Wednesday nights at my place having a couple girls over to every night having a girl over. I had a sauna in my house and a, you know, a jacuzzi and all, the, the whole nine, have girls over and drink and pop Percocets and then it turned into a daily thing where I had the blinds closed to no one coming over and I'm having the party by myself every night to being bloated because I'm taking 20, 30, 40, 50 of these things a day to someone saying, hey, try Oxycontin. There's no aspirin in it. Great. Trying that to full-blown junkie to finding out that I'm addicted to basically heroin, realizing that it's not just a painkiller that you can get in your parents' cupboard of their bathroom that that's innocent this is a serious problem to trying to quit to experiencing dope sickness the first time mm. worst thing ever to flying to dominican republic with my uh with my girlfriend to try to just get it behind me to coming back all i could think about was the drug the whole time i was there and going full into a deep dark spiral for for three years to losing three million dollars to <laughs> living in a theater room peeing in pop bottles with my five dogs around me for six months not talking to anybody with coke plates under the under the thing in an abandoned house with like junkies coming and going and like alcoholics living in my guest house to just completely losing my own identity and this is a span of over four years four years. all of that happened in rock four years. star to complete and total loser 
Four years. Four years. And how long until you f- – did you feel like you were addicted like that first Percocet? Absolutely. Like oh, it just addict. flipped the switch. That was it. My eyes lit up. I found the answer. $500 a day for four years. I was My spending. God. 500 bucks. Boom, 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 boom. And it just got to the point where the, the cash would go and then you'd sell something. That would go. You'd sell something else. Mortgage. Was yeah, it just I, had, kind of, I had 11 properties at one point, refinancing homes, ref, getting 100 grand at a time, partying till it's gone, refinancing another home, then forgetting to put tenants in my homes and letting them sit there and oh, just, geez. I lost everything. Yeah. And <laughs> now you never. Th- Selling a $60,000 chain and, and $18,000 worth of rings for like 16 grand so I could get pills. Yeah. And you never went. To the because you, I mean, oxycontin is basically heroin. Yes, it is. And you never went to the needles. You never went to the smoking. It. You were just that was your drug of choice. That was my drug of choice. I tried smoking it a couple times, but it didn't do anything for me. But I hate needles. Mm -hmm. So thank goodness I never did that. How did you know when you were at rock bottom, and then you were like, oh. Holy shit, I got to get some help now. I remember the exact moment. I was 55 pounds overweight. I was driving. Oh, I had moved to a place called Kelowna to get away from my family and friends that cared about me so I could really fully get into the drug addiction. Were they uh, trying interventions? Was there a no, lot of... No, they, they, they still thought I was, I was wonderful, our wonderful son. Oh, they turned their eye. They... Yeah, yeah. No, they were blind to it. Okay. You know, I, meanwhile, I'm nodding out as I'm talking to them, but they just didn't want to... They didn't want to see that their, their boy that they're so proud of was losing it right before their eyes. But it was but breaking I, their heart. They didn't know. They, 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 just, they literally just turned there was, I, there was nothing I could do wrong at the time. I had four Junos on the mantle and gold plaques and pictures of me and Willie Nelson. And there was, there was nothing their son could do wrong at the time. Because your lyrics, we haven't talked much about your music, but a lot of your lyrics reflect your lifestyle yeah so were they listening to the songs that you were putting out did they know that the lifestyle that you were living family friends that you said weren't aware of maybe your addiction because you were rapping i mean a lot of your lyrics are about that lifestyle right yeah but that kind of stuff started i started putting that stuff out near the end of it that okay when you like when when things were near the bottom things were crappy by the time that music came out and it would get to my parents ears you know a few years had gone by. Okay. All yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so um, I was 55 pounds overweight. I was driving to go buy like seven grand worth of pills on some weird little adventure I was on. My lips were purple. And, you know, my skin was super white. And I look in the mirror. A tear rolled. As I was driving, a tear rolled down my eyes. I remember I said, I'm going to die. Like I, was, I felt numb on this side. I said, I'm going to either die or I'm going to have to save my own life here because no one's going to do it for me. So I went to my parents, bawling my eyes out, and I just said, hey, I need your help. And they said, okay, this is serious. Let's let's take care of it. I got the best family in the world. Like, they're amazing. I'm super, super, super blessed. Mm-hmm. And, uh, like, super fortunate. And, uh, and we made a plan, and I said, give me six weeks to mentally prepare, and that's what worked for me. I mentally prepared every day, and it was the hardest thing I ever did, but I got to it. And what do you mean by mentally prepare every day for the recovery? Mentally prepared to go cold turkey because I knew I was going to get dope sick. I knew I was going to get violently ill. So you tapered yourself down? No. No, no. I just mentally, every day as I was doing the drugs, told myself that I was living in a trap and that I wanted to get my life back. I was just mentally preparing for it. Okay. I was, it was the biggest fear of your life hmm. to get off that drug because you know how sick you're going to get. So I, I, had to, I had to build myself up. You know, still like today, going to the dentist, I got to get my teeth all fixed, so I'm slowly doing that. I hate going to the dentist, but I got to get seven teeth pulled and new teeth put in and veneers and stuff. I got to do it, so I have to like mentally psych myself up. I'll go get two teeth fixed, then I chill for a while and put it off for a while, and then I mentally psych myself up because I hate needles. Mm -hmm. And and then after the six weeks, you went in, and it was probably one of the toughest things you've ever had to do. The toughest. The toughest thing, No, yeah. we're talking like ass out, like grabbing on, lying on the floor, screaming in a hospital, holding on to my dad's leg in a chair, kicking the wall, screaming, begging the doctors to kill me. Like if they would have put me to sleep, like they put a, can put a dog to sleep when the dog's ready to, yeah. you know, I would have let them do it. 
There's no doubt in my mind that I needed the pain to stop. There's no words to describe how ill the pain is. How long does it last? Well, the first 24 hours just keeps going. 48 hours just keeps going. Like I, I was flopping around like a dolphin. Oh, God. Like I wanted to come out of my own body. Like you, you, there's, you, you, there's no words to, to describe it. And it's it lasts a week. It lasts two weeks. The horrible part lasts about forty eight hours, and okay. then and then I was um, lethargic for like eleven days, not getting out of bed. But the worst part was over. But it still was terrible. Like you couldn't move. Like it was still terrible. But it was like you had gone through the worst part. So, and you but did you still and you saw the cravings? Yeah, you're do- You're sick. You're yeah, craving. no, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, 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 how yeah. long? How long did it? Because the there's the physical part of it, which, like you said, gets better with with time. And then there's also the psychological, emotional addiction of it, where and you're physically addicted too. But once that's out of your system, you still have that. I need it. I I want. I have the craving, right? Or were you able to? Yeah. You know, what I did is, I after the eleventh day, I got on a thing called Suboxone, which is a uh, opiate blocker with, with a partial opiate. Okay. So it's like for the best way to describe it is like when people take the patch when they want to quit smoking. Mm-hmm. Except this is an actual blocker. So if I was to take a Vicodin right now, nothing – it wouldn't affect me. The opiate part wouldn't affect me and get me high. Oh, it's see. like a blocker. So yeah. Plus if you tried taking too much of something, I would get sick. Mm-hmm. So I'm on Suboxone still, living life, happy, normal. And um, it, it's, you know, like people on heroin take methadone, except the only thing is you can take still extra methadone and get high. You can't do that with, with Suboxone. Uh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And do you, are you clean and sober? Yes. Oh, yes. great. Yeah. I don't drink. I don't do anything. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Uh, and it's how many years now? Well, I haven't done drugs for four years. I drank for a little while, for a while, uh, I was drinking again because I was single, thinking I got to drink with girls and all sure. that kind of stuff. And I did that for a while, and then I just sort of taught myself that I can still have fun being single. I don't need the alcohol, and and uh, I don't really like drinking. Yeah. So I could drink if I wanted to. I, I mean, there might be a time where I might have a glass of wine sometime because it goes well with dinner. But I just don't really like feeling drunk, and I, I work so hard, I don't like feeling like crap the next morning. I'm just mm-hmm. happy – Without it, like yeah. I'm not a sober person. Like, oh, I'm sober. Yeah. I just look at it as like I'm normal again. Yeah. I don't go to AA. I don't go to NA. I don't do any of that stuff. I did it on my own. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just I don't want to get addicted to something else where yeah. I have to go to meetings every day. I just don't have time for it. My very first tattoos were in Vancouver. I got Mad Child and North Van. Like that, just plain and simple, Mm -hmm. uh, where I'm from. Those were my first two. Then my second sitting was with Zodak in San Diego. I got uh, Misguided Angel tattooed right here. I got uh, this whole shoulder arm piece of like a Libra Scorpio type thing because I'm a Libra Scorpio. And then I got my mom and my grandma's name written uh, below my back neck. All, all, I sat two days. I got all three of those. Okay, that, down in San Diego. Yeah, and who you have uh, two characters on your chest? Correct. I have my grandma's face, my grandma who's still alive, and I have uh, my ex girlfriend who's a wonderful girl. We were off and on together for nine years, so I'm mm-hmm. happy to have her on me. Uh, I think we skipped over it when we first started the Mad Child nickname. H- how did how did you get the name Mad Child? Um, the very first group I was in was called What the Hell. And uh, DJ Flipout, who is now a big radio personality in Vancouver, he was my rap partner at the time. He he named me Mad Child just because I was, you know, I just had a temper. Uh, the axes was when I was not on drugs. I was sober, and it was basically just a my a commitment to to my fan base. We mm-hmm. I we we and I have an incredible loyal fan base. We consider them family, the Battle Axe Warriors. Battle Axe Dimes are the are the girls, uh, the ladies, and uh, just it was just my commitment to them to to the family. So you know, and I don't regret it. I yeah. like it. And then I got PMA right here for uh, positive mental attitude. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not gonna go crazy with the face. I think you know maybe one more little thing 
down the road, but that's about it. Yeah, what do you got coming up? Anything? What's your next? I got Mickey Mouse here. It was one of the most recent. Okay. I like that. I'll probably start doing some more cartoon characters and finish my legs. And we're also talking about the other massive fan base out there is ICP, who you're going right. out on tour with. Yeah, uh, I'm about to jump on a plane to go to Australia first, and then I go on tour across America with ICP. And I've been uh, fortunate enough to play the main stage the last two years at the Gathering of the Juggalos. And that's Insane Clown Posse, for those not dialed in. Right. ICP, Insane Clown Posse, and the Juggalos is their fan base. Uh, Amazing fan base. And I've been so fortunate that they've embraced me because they either love you or they hate you. Right. And if they hate you, you're, you're going to know it. You're getting stuff chucked at you. Massive. Oh, they're fans. Yeah. Oh. You, yeah. <laughs> but I've been fortunate that, that they, they, uh, they dig what I do. So um, I, I think they're great. And, and you know, they, they have a sort of a controversial thing with the outside world. Some people get it. Some people don't. I get it. I love it. You know, it's Battle Axe Warriors is still a relatively new thing. In a very short period of time, we 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 have five thousand documented members. They pay pay a hundred dollars to join and and become official tier two Battle Axe Warrior members, card holding members with privileges when you have the card. So we've have five thousand kids that have, have paid the hundred dollars to join. For that money, they get two T shirts, <clears throat> a, a big six foot. Uh, wall flag, uh, uh, skull bandana, dog tags, membership card, a patch for their vest. So they get well over a hundred dollars worth of stuff. So it's, this, this yeah. is not. We're not here to make money, but <clears throat> it is. You know, there's a business side to it, but it's not a money making thing yet by any means. We wanted to know exactly who every single one of our members are. So we have division leaders, and you can work your way up the ranks. And it's a little different that way, which which is very very cool. Um, I think one day it's going to be massive, yeah. but it's going to take me putting my career on hold and really focusing and, and owning in on the family and, and building it. And what's the site? Where can people check out all the Battle Axe Warrior info? BattleAxeWarriors.com. Suburban Noise has done some incredible stuff. Kevin Zinger is amazing. Yeah. They basically resurrected you know, Swollen Members and myself, but now we're sort of moving to phase two with Battle Axe. Thank you. Thank you again for coming right on. over. Thanks this for so having fun. me. The yeah. honor is mine. Thank Mad you. Child, check him out all over. And uh, thanks again, man. Good luck for the rest of the year. Thanks, brother.